Blog Talk Radio. The funeral is about to begin. The calling hours. When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk here. They will say that I have shed innocent blood. What's blood for? If not for shedding. Radio. This is your host, the dead man, Michael Jones of Horror Society, saying hello once again to all of our horror fans out there. Just to give you a bit of info, it is snowing in the illustrious state of North Carolina, and everyone is in a panic. So if the show drops off, it's probably because the phones and the power went down. So hopefully we'll get past all of that. We're going to have an excellent, excellent show this evening. There's there's a lot I'm excited for. Tonight, as our guests, we are going to have PJ Woodside and Steve Hudgens of, let me make sure I get this company name right, because it is pretty sweet, Big Biting Pig Productions. They're going to be on this evening to discuss their new film, The Caretakers, as well as some of their previous work. We're also, as as a added bonus, going to have two of the fine actors that were in that film. And those of us that are fans of cult films will remember the names of Bill Johnson and Joe Estevez. They will be joining us in the 9 o'clock hour. So when we start the interview at 8 8.30, we'll be talking with PJ and Steve. So really looking forward to that at the 8.30 hour. We are also, during our indie spotlight, going to have Necrostein on from Texas Tear Entertainment. So I wanted them to come on and tell us a little bit about what they do. They look like uh, they could be good friends with Horror Society. I think there's a lot that we can do together. As well as this evening in our Metal Blade spotlight, we are going to be playing... Sister is the name of the band, uh, their new album, uh, Disguised Vultures, which we heard the preview for last week, and uh, we'll get our double shot of them in, and I'll uh, talk a little bit about the album after the, the large interview. This evening, we're also going to be discussing Scream Factory's Blu-ray release of Saturn Three, and it's a movie I had not previously seen before, but I have to admit that... You know, I, I was pleasantly surprised. The cast and the crew were excellent, so we'll get into that film uh, towards the end of the evening. And then, you know, as a nice birthday surprise, because the dead man's birthday is this Saturday, our Metal Blade Spotlight for next week's album is... Uh, I, I picked it for next week not only because they're one of my favorite bands, it's going to be a great release, but February will also mark a month-long episodic reign of women in horror. Next week's episode, we will have Rebecca Herzberg from Women in Horror Monthly on, and the Soska twins will be coming on with her as well. There will also be a host of other incredible female talent that are a part of the Women in Horror Monthly network, and I look forward to having them on. The following week... We are going to get an hour-long exclusive interview with Felissa Rose, she of the infamous Sleepaway Camp. 
And she's an actress I've really, really been looking forward to interviewing as as she is someone who was definitely very influential in, in how my horror movie viewing went as I grew up. So we certainly have a lot to cover this evening. And the first thing we probably should get to before we have our have our friends from uh the Texas Terror Entertainment join us here in about oh, I'd say about ten, nine, ten minutes. We're definitely going to get to our news, and a lot of the news this evening pertains to DVD release. In fact, all of it does. We're starting to see a a slew of of great releases and movies that we want to see on Blu-ray. So the first one uh, comes from our friends at Arrow in the Head. The article was by Ryan Miller, and that's the uh, Return to Newcomb High Volume 1 Blu-ray release details and cover art. Anchor Bay Films proudly announces the return of Lloyd Kaufman to the theatrical feature director's chair with the March 18th Blu-ray and DVD release of Return to Newcomb High, Volume 1. The cast includes Catherine Kokorin, Asta Paredes, Debbie Rashan, Motorhead's Lemmy Kilmister, and introducing Kevin the Wonder Duck. Fresh from exclusive theatrical engagements in New York, Los Angeles, and other major markets, and still playing in exclusive theatrical engagements all over the world, Return to Newcomb High Volume 1, presented presented in all its director's approved unrated glory, graduates with a suggested retail price of $24.99 for the Blu-ray and $19.98 for the DVD. You know, as far as special feature goes, you know, Troma usually does it up. Um, Here's what we had. This is the listing that was listed with the article. Uh, Audio commentary with actors Zach Amico, Clay Von Karlowitz, Catherine Kokorin, Stuart Kizik, and Asta Paredes. We're also going to have an audio commentary track with writer-producer-director Lloyd Kaufman, producer-producer Justin A. Martell, executive producer Matt Manjuridis, associate producer Regina Katz, and writer Travis Campbell. Um, there's uh, features entitled Casting Conundrum, Pre-Production Hell with Mein Kampf, Special Ed Effects, Celluloid Kaufman, 40 Years of Traumatizing the World, Architects of Fear, Edison Device Music Video, and Return to Newcomb High Volume 2 Trailer. So it certainly appears that trauma is going all out. You know, I always think it's nice. I, you know, people can say whatever they want about Lloyd Kaufman or trauma. But a lot of people need to realize that it was people like Lloyd that that blazed a path for what a lot of us get to do or have worked on in the past. And, you know, one of these days I'd love to have Lloyd on and and pick his brain for an hour. But, but again, you know, this is something I'm definitely going to look at. I like the idea that it's going to be a uh, uh, steel cover from from the pictures it looked like. So I'm really excited about that. I'm looking forward to seeing it. I know a couple of uh, friends of mine have have seen – some of the screenings and have spoken very highly of it. So I'll definitely be looking forward to that one. Now, our second bit of news item, <coughs> excuse me, comes from Michael Gingold of Fangoria. Uh, released by Kraken, three classic Godzilla films on new DVDs and Blu-rays. And there's early cover art, which you can see at Fangoria's website. But uh, anime specialist Section 23 Films has launched a new home video distribution label called Kraken Releasing, which has three films from the golden age of Japan's Toho Studios coming on new DVDs and for the first time on Blu-ray in May. Kraken will issue Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster, a.k.a. Ibira, Horror of the Deep, Godzilla on Monster Island, which was uh, a.k.a. Godzilla vs. Gigan, and Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster, a.k.a. Godzilla vs. Hedera, on both disc formats on May 6th. Each will include Toho-approved transfers and present the movie in both English and Japanese with English subtitles. Special features have yet to be announced, and it says they'll keep you posted on those. The art may change as well. Retail prices are $9.98 each for the DVDs, $14.98 each for the Blu-rays. So once again, of course, with the the new Godzilla film getting ready to come out, we're starting to see some re-releases of some of the older Godzilla movies, and, and especially on Blu-ray. 
you know, again, I grew up on that kind of stuff, seeing the old rubber-suited Godzilla walking around destroying stuff will always be a childhood memory. So I'm definitely going to look into getting these, too, and hopefully be able to get some uh, reviews up for them. Definitely something to bring back for the, for this generation. Now, our friends at Scream Factory, uh, of course, are always on the cutting edge and releasing films uh, from our past that we love. And they have uh, released some howlingly cool artwork for dog soldiers. And this comes from uh, my man Hoovy over at Horse Society. And uh, he quotes from Scream Factory's uh, Facebook page that, Hot off the heels of their art reveal of Sleepaway Camp last week, we have another one for you to start the week off right. Check out the newly designed key art for the upcoming collector's edition of the epic werewolf film Dog Soldiers which will be a DVD and Blu-ray combo out on 624. This incredible vision comes to us from art, artist Nathan Thomas Milliner, who also did Sleepaway Camp, amongst other greats. Productions on Extras have just begun, and we'll have a full details to report to you as soon as... Uh, blah, 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 full details to report to you as to what they are in mid-April. Pre-order links on our site at ScreenFactoryDVD.com should appear in March, in which a limited edition 18 by 24 poster of the art will be available exclusively through them with the purchase of the combo. So, I mean, Dog Soldiers, excellent werewolf film, um, and I'm looking forward to it. I enjoy the alternate uh, poster art. Um, we do have it up on Horse Society. Like I said, Hoovy got it up there for you, so make sure to head over to HorseSociety.com. And check out the artwork for that. Now, the other bit of news I got, Tom Chen, my, my man over there at uh, Scream Factory, so, uh, we're going to have another DVD released to us. And this one is called Beneath. And as the press release uh, states, uh, Beneath rises on home entertainment shelves everywhere March 25th. Um, it's uh, it was a Chiller Films highly acclaimed movie. Uh, there's something terrifying in the waters in Black Lake, and what's above the surface is just as dangerous. On March 25th, 2014, Scream Factory will unleash director Larry Fessenden's enthralling creature thriller Beneath on Blu-ray and DVD. Featuring a general dose of suspense, terror, and wicked satire, Beneath follows a group of high school grads as they face the ultimate tests of friendship and sacrifice during a terror-stricken fight for survival, an allegorical tale about the tragic inability of people to rise above their differences, even in the face of grave threat. Directed by Fessenden, who also did Wendigo and The Last Winter, the film stars Danny Zavato, Innocence, Bonnie Dennison, Stakeland, Third Watch, Chris Conroy, Sorority Row, Johnny Orsini from Imogene, Griffin Newman from Political Animals, Mackenzie Rossman from Seventh Heaven, and Mark Margolis from Breaking Bad as Mr. Parks. Packed with special bonus features or special bonus content, Beneath is a must have for horror movie enthusiasts and loyal fans. The Blu ray has a suggested retail price of nineteen ninety seven and fourteen ninety three for the D V D. You can pre-order at Shout Factory. And uh, the synopsis of the film is, after their high school graduation, 16 celebrate with a trip to the remote and mysterious Black Lake. Only Johnny seems to suspect there's something in the water stalking the revelers as they set out on their small wooden rowboat, stocked with beer and a lethal chain of events, leave the teens stranded on the leaking vessel in the middle of the lake with no oars, no way back to the shore, held hostage by a menace that circles them persistently. And so the teens turn on each other, and the, pretty high school grieving, the petty high school grievances they almost left behind prove more deadly than the monster that waits to devour them. Chiller Films presents a glass eye Picks production in association with Off Hollywood Pictures. Beneath was written by Tony Daniel and Brian D. Smith, directed by horror icon Larry Fessenden. Produced by Fessenden and Peter Falk for Glass Eye Picks. Uh, special features for the DVD and Blu-ray include commentary with director Larry Fessenden and sound supervisor Graham Resnick, theatrical trailer, uh, Behind Beneath, 
outtakes, the poster and the premiere, and webisodes about what the Zeke. So that is something that will be certainly worth looking up when it comes out. And if we get any more information on it before its lease, I will be certainly letting you know about that. But now we are in for our Indie Spotlight. And to give you a little bit of information, I believe I have a Necrostein on the phone. Is that you, Necro? Hey, what's up, guys? What's going on, man? Not well, I'm right, just man. ready just to tell on. everyone. Cool, man. Well, I'll get, let me give everyone a little information about Texas Terror Entertainment. Um, you guys offer full horror promotions from movies to illustrators to books and musicians. Um, you guys are Correct. based out of North North Texas Terror Entertainment. Um it's the brainchild of Travis Puckett of Brimstone Productions and Tracy Crockett of Necroscopic Unlimited. So tell everyone, go into detail a little bit, exactly what you guys do and what you're bringing to the horror industry. Uh, well, I I started doing it back in 2003, kind of, and then I had some some difficulties and doing it off and on, but we got back into it, started doing. Like we just recently did some haunted houses for some some local haunted houses in the area. So we offer anything from you know special effects to journalism. You know, if somebody sends me a movie or sends us a movie, then we'll critique it and send them a review. And we'll go out and we'll post it around all over the place. And just anything that has anything about horror at all, if you want somebody to know about it, send it to us, and we'll do our best to make sure that everybody knows about it. We no, uh, what, what, we we go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, what personally drew you into into getting into Texas Terror Entertainment? Uh, well, I was I was really young and I started watching movies with my dad when I was like seven, and I've always loved horror movies. And I kept buying the Fangorias and buying the Fangorias, and I was like, I want to try this. Kept reading the articles about you know what people were writing and this and that, and just covering the horror industry. You know, you'd see it on TV where they're covering the, the main people that are in all these big you know blockbuster movies. But there wasn't anybody covering anybody that was still in the underground that still had better movies than a lot of the Hollywood movies. So I figured, sure. you know, with you know the the knowledge and the movies that I've watched over the last 15 years, that why not try to offer something back if I could? So sure. here we are, like nine, ten years later, and I'm still continuing to do it. Now, how wildly successful has it been? I mean, you know, how how far do you think your reach has gone? Like, tell people some of the projects that you guys have helped promote. Uh, well, um, we we helped a lot with. Are you all familiar with the movie that came out a few years ago called Conjure by Matt Bush? He he's the he's an illustrator for Star Wars and stuff. Well, he directed this movie that we did a lot of promotion for, and in return, it actually helped get it distributed a lot quicker and got it into a lot of. A lot of arenas for people to view it. We've um, we're responsible for it's a thing called the Texas Indie Meat Collaborative, where I sat down with a guy from California and we came up with the idea. We would have a three day weekend where we invited people from all over the United States to come to one location and do one thing or another that involved filmmaking. So we decided that we were going to do a film. It started out as a short film, and the next thing you know, director after director after director, and we had seven directors that wanted to be involved in this, so we made it into a full-length feature, which brought, which brought uh, over 150 people to Gainesville, Texas, for a 31-hour film shoot. Everybody showed up. They synced up their cameras. You know, all the directors, of course, had had their scenes. So they knew what they were doing, but <clears throat> excuse me, but nobody rehearsed. We just shot and went. Right. You know, just complete guerrilla style. Made a movie to see what we could do, and it was fun. You know, made a lot of contacts out of it, which, in return, have gained me a lot of contacts in different areas of the industry. When it, whether it's composing music or illustrating, or even down to you know inkers on comic books, just going through and the love for this genre, of being a huge comic nerd and being covered in tattoos from the horror and comic book industry. That's sure. really all that I know how to do. It's all any of us, anybody that's involved in Texas Tier Entertainment, we're all just a hodgepodge of group from people ranging from, like one person specializes in dark poetry, and one person specializes in music solely, and we just kind of come together and offer up, you know, our thoughts on something and hope that somebody takes it to heart and actually 
goes out and checks it out because of what we said. Now, let me ask you this, because, you, you know, you're kind of on the, the promotional side and you work in the industry as well. What have you found to be the most challenging aspect of what you do? You know, it's, you know, like whether it's promoting a film or if you're doing a review or if you're doing a fact, what is it about the industry you find the most challenging? Uh, honestly, it's it's producing. Honestly, anything that it, it's trying to get, I mean, anybody in this industry knows it's really hard to get people to get involved, to, you know, to back you on things if you don't have a lot of stuff to show for it. It's just, right. you know, people just don't want to do it anymore. They don't want to spend their money on it. Producing, it's it's fun because, you know, you get involved in bringing everything together. But sometimes I would have to say it's the – it's the number of things that you have to do, you know, on, on the on the journalist part of it. You know, for running a website, and you have, you know, one week alone, you have 15 different people send you a screener that they want you to watch and review, and you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> and so you, you've literally got – you've got to stop, and you've got to make time to honor this because they're taking time out of their day to send you their work, and they want an honest opinion on it, and it's only sure. fair. And sometimes that's – that's really the most challenging part is there's just not enough time in the day for me to do what I want to do, realistically. Uh, definitely. Oh, believe me, it's it's the same way at Horror Society. There's so much to cover, and you want to try and help everyone, and it's not always possible. But um, Right, and plus me, I also write for other websites as well. So. Certainly. Now let me it's, ask you this. Since you do a lot of promotional work, what is what is the most common theme that you wind up telling new filmmakers when when they're trying to promote their film? Uh, honestly, <clears throat> to not get discouraged by any negative feedback. A lot of them do. I've, I've had people send me reviews, and it wasn't the greatest review, and they got really upset, and they wanted me to take it off the website. They're like, you know, if this, this keeps happening, I'm like, well, fix it. It's like we're all trying to tell you the problems that we see from watching all of these movies all the time. We're not being sure. assholes. It's just fix it, you know. Just don't don't get discouraged. Don't don't let somebody that says something negative about your movie make you not want to do something because you're not going to please everyone. Exactly. exactly. You, you just got to move on and try to do the best. Now, what's coming up in the future for Texas Terror Entertainment? Anything big going on? Well, right now I'm in the process of number one. We're trying to convert the website to a digital magazine to where, number one, you can either download it online or you can order a PDF DVD of it. Oh, nice. And we're, we're in the process. I'm starting a author spotlight where I believe it's probably going to be once every two weeks, maybe once a month, where I'm going to take an author. They're going to write something specific for the website, and then I'm going to do – you know, like a photo shoot and an interview and just a full 100% promotion on whatever it is they had to promote for an entire month hardcore. You know, like I said, we hit up a lot of conventions. I do a lot of work for distribution companies at conventions, so I take everybody's flyers. Anything anybody's got, bring it to me, and I'll be glad to pass it out at a convention. I never leave with any of the promotional stuff that I end up going to with. It's always passed Very out. Very nice. Well, look, we at Horror Society, we like what you do, man. We'll put up a feature article so we can send people your way. If there's any filmmakers out there that want to get in touch with you, give them an address so that they can get in touch with you guys and, and get the ball rolling. Right on. Uh, well, right now my site is being trans transferred over to the domain, but the best way to get a hold of me is just to go to Google and type in Texas Terror Entertainment. It'll take you straight to the Facebook page, and any and all contacts of everybody are from that page. Very nice. Well, Necro, thank you for coming on, man. If you ever have any news you need to pass on, let us know. And if I hear anything, I'll send it your way, man. I appreciate it, buddy. Man, it's been fun. I love y'all's guys' sight. Keep up the good work, dude. We appreciate it, man. You keep doing what you're doing, too. All right. Thanks, buddy. All right, man. And once again, that was Necro Stein from Texas Terror Entertainment. If you're looking to promote your film, these are guys that you definitely need to look into. In about six minutes, we are going to begin our interview with our friends – so 
Sorry about that. Had a little bit of delay there. Cat kicked open the door. <laughs> We're going to have our friends PJ Woodside and Steve Hudgens on at the 8.30 time to speak about their upcoming film, The Caretakers. And at 9 o'clock, we will have Bill Johnson and Joe Estevez joining in as well. So stay tuned, because coming up next in our Metal Blade Spotlight, we have Sister. The name of the CD is Disguised Vultures. The name of the song is We Salute Them. Disguised Vultures in the Metal Blade Spotlight. 
we will be hearing from them again a little bit later in the show. But now we are going to begin our interview with two of our four guests for the evening. This is the Dead Man on Horse Society Radio. Is this Steve? This is Steve. Hey, Steve, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I am fine. I'm glad to have you on. And it looks like PJ is here as well. Let's get PJ on with us. Hello, right is this PJ? Hey, PJ. Uh-huh. <laughs> Hi. Sorry, guys. You guys, you guys called right as the music interlude started, and I can't pick up when it's in the middle of that. So oh, I no, apologize. That's okay. <laughs> I was I had turned the sound off so I wasn't sure what was going on. Oh, okay. Well, I I'm glad you guys made it on. First of all, let me let everyone know you guys are behind Big Biting Pigs Productions the Caretakers. Uh just a little bit of background info on you guys uh from your the, the Big Pig Big Biting Pig Productions website. Steve is the founder of Big Biting Pig Productions. Uh he's an accomplished actor in front of the camera and on stage. He's also a director and an award-winning writer. PJ is a co-producer with Big Biting Pig Productions and has won awards as a director, actor, and sound editor. Tell us a little bit about how the two of you came together and how Big Biting Pig Productions came to be. Well, we were we met um, doing theater, and uh, Steve, shortly after we met, had an interest in um, making movies and was involved in another project um, before we before he started Big Bang Pig Productions and with the other project it was going pretty well and he wanted to continue uh, you know when pursuing movie making and so at the time um, I had just started into some video editing um, work and so he brought me in toward the end of that other project and we worked so well together that when he started when he founded Big Biting Pig Productions um and asked me to partner with you know with the projects I was I was excited about it <laughs> so that's basically how it got started and we just sort of dove in you know um not really having a lot of uh, a lot had a lot of background experience that helped with all of that I mean I have a writing background and some act- acting experience but but uh, putting that all together into movie making was a new thing, and really great. It's been really great. It's been a great ride. How about, <laughs> how about on your end, Steve? How was it? When, how was it at the at the founding point of Big Biting Pig Productions? Well, like TJ mentioned, I had I had uh, made another movie. I was uh, co-director and and uh, wrote the script for it. It's a obscure movie called The Third Floor, and uh, made it with a couple of uh, acting friends of mine. And it was, it was. I I didn't have much of a background. I didn't have any of a background as far as filmmaking goes. One of my uh, one of the other actors had a background in uh, in college. He had a little bit of a background in filmmaking. So um, we kind of just all got together, uh, not really knowing what we were doing, and attempted to make this movie. And we did. We we made the movie. It's it's not very good, being in a first <laughs> effort, but we were we were able to do it and. Uh, when we finished, I I was just feeling like I was getting warmed up. I'm like, okay, now I've got a little bit of a grip as to how to do this, and and I wanna I wanna keep rolling with this. And the other guys were kind of burned out on it, so that's where I I branched off and created uh, Big Biting Pig Productions, and uh, that's when I approached TJ because she had edited um, the the uh, third floor of that that movie, and uh, so I I asked her if she'd be interested in getting on board, and fortunately for me, she was, and we've just been going nonstop ever since. Now, looking back at it, when you both first started doing all of this, you know, how much do you feel? How much do you feel it's changed in in the short time that you've been w- working together with big, you know, big biting pig, and a lot. A lot. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, yes, a lot. A lot has changed. I mean, and it, you know, it, it's great because even at that time we could, make a, we could make a movie on our own and do all the parts on our own. But, uh, I mean, it just seems like, uh, you know, independent production companies have popped up everywhere since then. So it's really been a huge growth in that area, I think. You're, and we've gotten better with each movie. That's, that's the big thing is uh, – um, 
were the caretakers, which we'll be releasing this summer, is is our um, what is it? That's our eighth movie. Yeah. And uh, so we we get a little better with each movie. It's kind of like anything else. The more you do anything, the the better you get at it. And so eight movies later, we are we've come a long way from uh, the first movie we did um, for Big Biting Pig Productions, which is uh, Maniac on the Loose. Uh, I mean, we watch Maniac on the Loose now, and we're not we're not real thrilled <laughs> with it. It's it's pretty rough, but. Uh, you know, I think it's, everyone it's, that's worked in film feels that way about their first one. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, it'll it'll always be special to me. I like the story, but I mean, when we watch it, we're like, oh my gosh, we we should have done this and we should have done that. But yeah, but you know, we, we had to do oh, those things come a long to learn. Way. So, right? Yeah, we we had to do those things to learn. And when was when did that come out, Steve? Was that two thousand and we released Maniac in the 2008. 2008. 2008. 2008, okay. 2007 when we were filming it, okay. So, right. yeah, we do a movie a year. We're kind of crazy that way, you know, but uh, we actually did two movies in one year, and we decided that was not a good idea. So we. Uh, well, I was, you know, was going to ask you about some of your old, your other films before we get to The Caretakers. And, you know, all of your films definitely have, have that, you know, that horror thriller vein running through them. What was it specifically about the horror genre that appeals to you, and what do you feel like you tried to do to bring something new to the genre every time you do a project? Yeah, that's really me. I'm, yeah, I'm the I'm the I'm the guy with the horror background. I've always just been a horror uh, and thriller fan. Halloween and uh, The Shining are really my two favorite uh, horror movies or thrillers, whatever you want to call them. And uh, so that's always that's just always kind of been what I I, uh, I enjoyed. And when I started writing, when I was young, that's that's just kind of what I wrote. I I just wrote stories that that were along that that line. And so um, we were going to be writing our own movies. So that's just kind of the way it went. I don't I don't know that PJ was too uh, too wild <laughs> about that at the at the get go. Uh, really I would yeah, I'm more of a, I mean, I'm more from a literary background, actually, but I would have to say that he kind of awakened a monster in me because I, I was, it gave me a lot of freedom being able to, to write a story with uh, horror in the horror genre, the, you know, or suspense genre. And I, I, I was able to play around with some ideas that would never have, you know, work in another uh, genre. So it's, it's been different for me, but I, I'm, I'm kind of enjoying it. And, and as far as okay. what we bring different, I think, Steve, you, you probably have some response for that. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we don't want to be churning out the same old thing that everybody else does. It's not, it's not hard to find the status quo movies um, anymore. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of movies are just kind of the same old thing. And while we will sometimes explore, and often explore uh, subgenres that have been done before, I mean, Monster in the Woods, Serial Killer, uh, Scary Doll, Ghost movies, no, we'll, zombies. We'll, yeah, zombies. We we have a zombie movie. I mean, we we try to approach those uh, from a different perspective, kind of put a fresh new twist on on that idea. And I think we've been uh, largely uh, successful in in doing that. Right. Certainly, we don't certainly. pursue we don't pursue um, gore um, for gore's sake. We we really focus on the characters, the kind of things that we enjoy in the classic horror movies, where you feel in, like you're in the shoes of the character. So it doesn't have to be bloody, gory, you know, a crazy scare out of, around every corner. If you are in the character's shoes, you're going to feel that scare. And that's that's what we, we try to have some respect for our audiences, for one thing, and, and to really focus on character. And we usually have plot twists. <laughs> <laughs> What it <laughs> now, now one of the things that you have on your site, Steve, that that I find interesting is um, you were recently referred to by Friday the Thirteenth writer Victor Miller as a horror meister to reckon with. Yeah. Um, how did you feel to have Victor Miller tell you that? And 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 you know, do you have a relationship with Victor? I mean, do you guys do you talk shop or things like that? <laughs> I mean, it's an honor, first, first of all. Yeah, it's it's just an honor to uh, have somebody of that caliber mention me like that. That was that was great. I I love that. So I, I mention that quote to people every chance I get. But uh, sure. um, we well we we uh, I guess we, we met Victor on on Facebook. He yeah. um, 
He uh, actually he got wind of one of our movies, and then he suggested that I guess we invited him to the premiere of which one? Uh, and I think it was Hell's Bowl. Bowl. Yeah, yeah, and he he mess he replied that he couldn't make it out, but we'd be happy to review it. So I was like, well, okay. <laughs> So that's kind yeah, of so, started relationship yeah we sent the movie into it and he and he really liked it and we've we've been sending uh our movies to him uh ever since and uh he seems to be getting a pretty good kick out of him he he seems to enjoy them all we we got to meet him he actually was up here for a writing workshop uh in uh not too far from our neck of the woods so we actually got to meet him in person then and uh that was pretty neat and he 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 just told us you know your your stuff is is entertaining it's just fun so that that's real nice to hear. Yeah, he's a real good guy. Certainly. Huh? You know, well, let me ask you this. It's, you know, both of you it lists in, in your accomplishments that you have done work on stage as well. Or, yeah. excuse yeah. me, that's uh, that's Steve. No, I have too. And, and, you've, done, and you've done several stage plays yeah. as well, yes. Let me ask right. you this. How, how have your experiences on with stage and theater help to translate to film you know what have you brought from from that from that one area to the other i actually i think it's it's a harder transition than it seems like i mean the easy things that translate are you know you you know about character and learning lines and um things like that but it's a it's completely different presence when the camera is on you than when you're on stage and sometimes we have to we have to help people who are stage actors to unlearn that <laughs> um, to be in front of the camera. I mean, there are things that are similar, like scheduling, you know, uh, coordinating, knowing that you've got all these different parts of it that are that are going to be important, and you have to pay attention to all those parts, you know, to make the end product work. Um, but, but there's also some differences that can really um, get in the way, I think, for yeah. some people. Yeah, I mean, act, as far as theater, I mean, acting is acting, but there's a there is a big difference between stage and movie, and you'll you actually see the difference if you if you look at our our uh, latest movies compared to like Maniac and the Loose. Maniac and the Loose, the performances in that are much broader than than I would like. They're they're much more theatrical because that's kind of where we were coming from with with our stage experience, and as that's just another area that we've improved on. Um, movie acting is much more subtle. You have to be much more subtle. Um, the camera reads thoughts, and if you're faking yes. it, it's it's fake. It's <laughs> obvious, yeah. Right. Now, like you had mentioned, you guys have basically done a film a year for the last couple of years, and you did two in 2009. Mm-hmm. You know, you had mentioned that you would never do two films in a year again. Um, no, I, I've I've not directed my own film, but I have worked on several films in a year's period. What what did you find the most difficult thing about working on two projects? Was it you know did did shooting and post production take longer than you think? Um, well, was I, it I mean, I, I I'm sorry, did I interrupt? No, you? <laughs> please, no, 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 go ahead. Well, I was I was going to say I I think you know we would probably do more than a film a year uh, if with bigger budget and more assistance but you know doing it doing all of the parts as we have been especially that early in the process it was just very taxing and i think we probably didn't give uh, as much attention to either of the two that came out as we do you know with each one it's good to focus on one um for a while anyway and even when we've overlapped a little bit it's been harder to go okay we're starting this new movie, we're casting, but we haven't had our premiere for our last movie yet. It kind of the energy kind of crosses over, if that makes sense. Um, sure, so the, sure. You know, and we're both working, you know, day jobs as well. So, um, you know, it's it, at this point, we we I'm doing a lot of smaller projects, and Steve partners with me on on those as well for more like commercial projects. But um, as far as the movie, it's you know we do our own we do our own stuff. So I write. I'm writing the script for next year's movie. So you know, it's a, it's a lot of it's a lot of steps, a lot of work. Um, yeah, the bottom sure. line is there's there's only 24 hours in a day, <laughs> so we've yeah. only got so much time. It's it's really a time thing. We've it's uh, we were nuts to do two movies uh, in the same year back then. We didn't realize it at the time. We just did it. Yeah. But uh, yeah. it was it was it was a to- it took a little bit of a toll on us, and uh, it was a great learning experience. But uh, 
Yeah, it's we find that it's better just to concentrate on, on one a year at this point. Now, when we you really released your pre- no, okay, sorry, I, I was just going to ask when you've released your previous films, um, what route have you gone through? Have you gone through more of, you know, the film festival route, self distribution, and what are you looking to do with Caretakers once it's done? Yeah, that's that's another area that's that's changed uh, significantly. When we first started out with Maniac on the Loose back in 2008, it was mostly a uh, looking to sell that um, via DVD. And um, five years later, streaming is the thing. Now people are actually, I mean, for a long time it was like, oh, streaming will be the thing, but it wasn't the thing. It, it took a little while for it to catch on, and people are actually starting to, to um do that now so that's really the the main focus now for us and we we do make all of our movies available on uh dvd all of our movies are available on dvd but the big thing now is is streaming there's a lot of different uh there's a lot of different avenues for streaming and and people are people are watching them now so that is our main focus now is to get our movies uh streaming and we we have a distributor who uh who we work with who uh um, does a great job at getting them out there for us. So uh, we're we're on a we feel like we're on a on a pretty good path right now. Now, now are, are, are you guys? Are from, go ahead. I was just going to say, a movie from two years ago, The Creepy Doll, has, has really picked up on, on streaming the last uh, couple of months. Um, it's on Amazon now, and it's really getting a lot of hits. So that's that's always cool, you know. That we've done two movies since that. And so I haven't given a lot of thought to that movie, and now seeing a lot of people write reviews, it's kind of cool. Right. Well, now, what I wanted to ask you, you know, from there was, are you, you know, are you guys adverse to doing the film festival circuit? Well, we do some film festivals. The, the main issue for us is is um, being able to get to very many of them. Sure. Um, we we're trying to be selective. Uh, but we haven't done a lot of that in the past, but we will be looking for more avenues for that as well. Um, we usually hit the local, um, you know, conventions and kind of network there. Um, Steve, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, that's that's kind of uh, what PJ mentioned. We, we focus mostly on uh, regional uh, areas as far as uh, film festivals goes. We, we don't put out a heavy uh, film festival campaign uh we were like pj mentioned we're we're a little bit more selective it's uh you know it's it's quite frankly it's a costly project if you go too heavy with it yeah. so uh that's sure. that's one of the main reasons yeah, why we try to be uh selective right i've got i've got lucid submitted to a lot more for this coming year so um you know we'll see we'll see how that turns out <laughs> Well, you know, like you guys talked about how things have changed in the time that you've been mm-hmm. in. What are your thoughts on how fundraisers and how um, social media is used to promote film these days? That's wonderful. <laughs> I mean, we have we've kind of developed a fan base um, through uh, you know social media, grassroots efforts, getting you know introducing people to our movies that way, and then they see them they come to the premiere they get excited about it and they they enjoy one so they continue to you know to follow us and we've we've got quite an active fan base and um uh, you know it shows when we have our premieres and we have a lot of enthusiasm and excitement on you know we just need to what we're looking to do with the caretakers and with the next one i think is to step up step it up to the next level and then get a little bit more um uh, a little bit wider um you know, fan base, get a little bit yeah, more it's, attention. It's huge. Right. I mean, social media is huge. It's not difficult to follow us. We're we're active on Facebook. Right. We we give uh, daily updates. So it's not uh, once once people find us, it's not hard to uh, to follow us, and it's not hard to find out how to see our movies. And as far as uh, fundraising goes, um, we just did our first Kickstarter last year for the Caretakers. Um, we we decided to give that a try. It's the first time we've ever tried uh, to actually raise funds in that capacity, and it was successful. We we got a lot of people um, who uh, supported us and mm-hmm. and uh, donated to us, and because of that, we were able to get Bill Johnson and uh, Joe Estevez in, mm-hmm. in the caretakers. So that, that worked out great for us. 
And I think one of the reasons that they did support us is because they could see we had completed projects. So they either knew about us already or they, so they were excited about what the next thing was going to be. You know, so we we had a foundation to build on. Well, tell us a little bit. Start telling us about caretakers because we'll have um, Bill and Joe are supposed to join us around the nine o'clock hour. So, right. tell us about how the caretakers came to be. Well, caretakers is a, a movie that uh, that I wrote, and I had had this idea for for a little while. It's it's our it's our take on a vampire movie, but I wanted to do something a little different. So instead of making the vampires the focus, I wanted to focus on the vampires' caretakers. Now, uh, anybody familiar with, like, the Dracula, the classic Dracula, Renfield was kind of his caretaker. And uh, in the Fright Night movies, there were, uh, in both of the Fright Night movies, there were caretakers of, of some sort. And most recently in Let the Right One In, they focused sure. a little bit on, uh, while it was about the uh, the vampire uh, girl and, and the new young boy, they did, she did have kind of a caretaker of sorts that they they um, focused on a little bit. And I wanted to make a movie that where the main focus is the caretakers. The vampires are kind of the backstory, and it's really more so about these these people who their lives are to help a vampire exist and in in the caretakers it's really the story of two different caretakers one's a uh, caretaker for a uh, a older yeah. very powerful uh, vampire and uh, he's going through some life changes he's he's uh recently uh his there were supposed to be there's two caretakers uh, at a time. There's supposed to be about two care, two to three caretakers at a time to make life easier on them. And he lost his mentor, so he's he's going through a uh, a life change where he's kind of the sole the solo caretaker for this powerful care, caretaker. And we focus on him dealing with that and teaching some yeah. some new caretakers uh, the ropes. And then we have a hybrid vampire who's kind of this. Uh, a little bit more of a wild hybrid and and she's got this young caretaker who's who's really trying to help her through it they and neither of them knows what the hell is going on they're just they're they're kind of uh trying learning as they go yeah so it's and it's a completely kind of different lore of it. right it's completely different lore of vampires yeah that's, that's, that's another thing about the caretakers we we reinvent the the whole vampire mythology we we explain um that there are a lot of the staples in, in your classic vampire lore. In this, we explain that it's just loosely based on reality. So we um, we explain that it's you don't become a vampire; you're actually born a vampire. And we get into the the, the whole thing about changing one into a vampire by biting them, and the problem with the sun, and uh, details about sucking of the blood and the aging process of a vampire we we kind of reinvent all that and and get into that so it's 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 really a, a completely new take on on vampires in general and uh, a, a new perspective to just a general vampire story so it sounds if like that you makes kind sense. Of you guys yeah well it sounds like you guys kind of went in between the the sparkly touchy feely vampires of twilight but you know they're not the you know the the infamous killing machines of say like Underworld or or the Blade series. So you you're, you're more in that. I mean, is that a fair assessment? I mean, it's more of that in between ground. Well, there's nothing um, sparkly about them. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> it's more of a they're they're more of a different different creature. They're not evil, but they are a different animal. So. Um, they have, you know, they have their own needs, and um, that's what it is. I they're think... they're mammals. They're, I mean, the, a vampire in the caretakers is just another mammal with uh, their own lifestyle. I mean, now if you look at a human and you look at a tiger, they live completely different lives, but they're both mammals. Sure. So it's kind of like that. It's just, you know, here's here's a vampire just just living living their lives. They're this is what they do. It's there's nothing. It's not that it's wrong or bad. They're not human. They're they're vampires, and this is just the life that they live. Mm-hmm. The, co- the conflict arises because of 
um, uh, people being careless and um, creating this the hybrid and and uh, there is kind of a pursuit going throughout. Um, so it's you know it's not I mean it's more about that um, as a story, but the backdrop is you know does include all of that lore, different lore and different settings. Pretty interesting. It's a it's a little, little bit more serious of a movie I think than some of our others. Now, Steve, you wrote this one. Now, as an interesting question, since you were both writers, you know, were there did, when you read the script, PJ, you know, was there were there ever any conflicts or questions? Did you guys ever have debate about certain things ever written? I mean, do you guys talk oh, about always, it like always. that or? Oh, always. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I mean, you know, we. I mean, it's one of the things that we know we can. Um, we know we can say whatever we think about it, and we trust each other's judgment. So even if I disagree with him, um, he'll, you know, I'll listen to what he has to say, and usually it will make an impact in one way or another. Um, and same for, you know, same goes for him. Now that's one of the reasons why we've continued to make movies together. We collaborate on every stage of the process, and, and we collaborate really, really well. I would yeah, say. that's the, that's that's our process. One of us writes the script, and then we send it to the other one and the other one um gives their thoughts on it and and we take each other's uh, thoughts seriously and um and most of most of the scripts wind up being while one of us has the title of writer it really is a collaboration now where were some of the locations that you guys shot the film we shot um we shot the majority of the movie in western kentucky as we do with with most of our movies um the pretty cool thing about the caretakers is there's a little town called Princeton, Kentucky. It's um, and that, yeah. it's it's a uh, it's just a really neat little old town. And we yeah. we uh, you the the house for the main caretaker is a house that was built in the 1860s. Uh, this wonderful couple let us use their house, and yeah. it's built in 1860s, and it's still got. I mean, it's just a really cool big house that's still decorated like it was in the 1950s. It's just got yeah. this really, it's really, really cool uh, feel to it, and uh, we were very fortunate to be able to get that. That's kind of the main uh, area that we use the most. Yeah. But we, I mean, the towns that we shot in: Princeton, Kentucky; Dawson Springs, Kentucky; Madisonville, Kentucky; and Nashville, Tennessee. That's where we um, where we shot the uh, entire movie. Nice. Now, shooting with you know shooting in a lot of locations like that, in particular someone's house, did you run into any difficulties with shooting? Like, um, I know on films that I've worked on, they didn't anticipate that the lights would touch the ceiling. You know, stuff like that. We cover that stuff pretty good before uh, before we ever uh, agree get keep people to to we we make it real real clear to everybody who offers up a location exactly what they're getting into <laughs> so there's usually no surprises that's it's real well, important also, that we do that yeah we're also pretty good at um you know uh, thinking on our feet and for example when we went to nashville because we didn't have a chance to really look at the location too much beforehand one of the windows where we plan to shoot toward um, it needed to be a night scene, and we thought we could cover it outside, but it was too high up to cover outside. And so what we did was we just rotated the, scene, you know, rotated what we had planned, um, and it worked out just fine. But that, those are the sort of things that do come up. And you have to just be, you have to plan as much as you can, but then also be prepared to think on your feet. Oh, certainly. But no, that's, no that's major issues or anything with any other locations. No, no major no. issues or anything like that. Not, not no. for the caretakers. <laughs> Nice. Well, now, of course, we know um, Joe and um, Bill should be joining us here shortly. And before we start talking about them, tell us a little bit about some of the other cast that's involved in the film and, and how they became involved in the process. Well, two of actually, two of our leads um, were in, the, in Lucid, which is my movie from last year. And we also had Bill Johnson in Lucid. He played um, He played the kind of uh, a evil uh, character of the dreams. He's the main character, uh, Pawpaw. So we already had worked with Bill, um, and um, when we uh, did our auditions, um, you know, we're able to, to see the, the other two characters, the other two actors um, in these parts for this movie. So that's how that ended up 
that's happening. Who else? Is, who else, Steve? Nick, uh, Faust. Nick Faust, who's known he's more as a director. He's he's directed everybody, but he's he's an actor too, and he does a fantastic job in this. He really plays the uh, the lead role, which is the uh, caretaker to the uh, to the established vampire. Right, and then Brittany Saylor is is um, April April. What's April's last name now? <laughs> Jennings. Jennings. April Jennings is um, the main vampire, and um, she's done some stuff with us. She hasn't done a, a lot beyond that. And um, Brittany Saylor is the younger uh, half brand vampire, and she is out of Nashville and has done um, several things. And then Michael Kuhn plays the other caretaker, um, and he's uh, local. He's somebody who's worked with us before. Um, and then Nick is out of Actually, Nick has like has lived in New Orleans and Los Angeles, but he's um, out of uh, Western Kentucky now. So, and Steve has a part in it, and I have a part in it. Now, what do you guys think one, about? Go ahead. I was just going to say one thing about uh, Nick Faust that it, I think some people find interesting is uh, anybody who is uh, familiar with uh, theater probably has heard of the uh, stage play The Foreigner by Larry Hsu, and Nick Faust was the first person to ever direct that. He actually directed the uh, premiere of that in, in Milwaukee, which is which I think is pretty neat. <laughs> he he, he doesn't like, like when have... I bring that up, but I think it's pretty cool. It looks like we have one of your co-stars here. Okay. Hi. Thank you Joel, for calling the call. Here. Hey, yeah, am I Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. How are you, sir? <laughs> um, good. How are you and PJ? All you folks there and uh, hey Joe, where, this is where Steve. you at? How are Kentucky, you? someplace? <laughs> uh, I think the host is in New York, actually. <laughs> oh, New York! Oh, excellent. Oh, All I'm, right. I'm in yeah. North Carolina, so yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh that's okay. right, North Carolina. Okay. Yeah, okay, we're in the middle of that All great right. snowstorm. Well, oh, I mean, geez. welcome to, welcome to the show, uh, show Joe. Um, we had just started talking about the cast and the crew, so let me ask uh-huh. you. How did you get involved with the caretakers, and what can you tell us about your experience on set? Uh, uh, we we had this uh, mutual uh, friend that PJ uh, uh, ran into at a, at a film festival, and uh, she had this this character available. She said, "Who could you recommend?" And he recommended me, and PJ called, and as they say, uh, the rest is. Uh, the rest is uh, history, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know it, it, the set. Uh, it couldn't have been uh, more comfortable. I mean, it was uh, PJ is uh, terrific, and uh, uh, her husband uh, directing, and uh, I mean the whole cast. Uh, the, the, the young lady uh, uh, playing the lead was was terrific. Just just very um, comfortable. I, I really uh, enjoyed myself. I didn't get beat up. Didn't get dirty. Didn't have to run. <laughs> so it, <laughs> it was all good. I should clarify well, that Steve Steve is not my husband, but I mean I, I that gets that's mistaken a lot. <laughs> oh, he's telling everybody he's your husband. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it's all all everybody who <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I just want to let us that. let everyone know that Bill Johnson has now also joined us. Bill, how are you this evening? I am fine as Rob's here. How are y'all? Uh, <laughs> We're good. Thank yeah. you for joining us. Well, I, I yeah. just asked Joe, and of course I've been talking with um, with uh, <laughs> you guys have got me all crossed up with PJ <laughs> and Steve. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you, you know, how did you become involved with the caretakers, and and how would you describe your experience on set? Mm, okay, first question: How did I become involved? Uh, because I'd, I've been involved in Lucid, PJ's film, just before that. And uh, they were kind enough to call me back and, and be in their next movie. Especially, yeah, it was great because Joe was playing too. And uh, on the set was it was great. Um, work with uh, a lot of professionals uh, in, <laughs> in my minuscule view, uh, but really high high class ones like you know Academy Award winners like uh, Stone. And, uh, oh. yeah, you know, that guy, um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, you know, and, um, and it's been a long time since I played ball with an insane actor like Joe, 
<laughs> uh, uh, oh, you che- Bill, your check is in the mail, okay? I love you. <laughs> okay, keep them coming. I'm going to do some yes, more Yes, now. sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, I was, no, I, I was astounded when I first met you. I took an instant liking to him. And he says, it reminds me of someone. <laughs> he could remind me of, and he, oh, he reminded me of a, a relative of mine who is who is a priest, who is an uncle of mine. And I went, oh, huh. that's weird. And and then when <laughs> Joe started, you know, doing his scene, then I knew why. I, he reminded me because Joe is like, is like a priest in the theater, and he's in prayer when he's performing. Oh man, yeah. oh, real great. Well. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and back at you, I, I tell you, just uh, you know that that was just a, just a marvelous treat working with Bill, and I mean as professional he is, as real as he is uh, uh, in his acting, it's just uh, you know they say uh, good actors make good actors better actors, and it's never truer than than uh, than working with Bill. And uh, thank you for those kind words, uh, Bill. But you know I'm only as good as you make me, my friend. Oh, y'all are so good. <laughs> I love to hear this. Well, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, both Joe and Bill, you know, you guys, you know, you have your pedigree in, in, in different types of films, in particular horror. You know, what do you feel like The Caretakers is going to bring that, you know, you haven't done in your other films? What sets it apart from the other stuff that you guys have worked on? Uh, well, for me, it's it's you know I love that it's uh, that it's uh, psychological rather than just this violence and this this blood and, and gore. Not that those are the films that, that we make most of the time, but that there there was a plot, that there was a there was a story there, there was real uh, uh, characters that uh, interacted with each other. I mean, the, the the lead in the film, the young lady, is is Bill's daughter who who has run away. And I mean, imagine you know the father's feeling when when he loves his daughter, and yet you know she's become you know she's become a a vampire, you know, and he he can't save her, and yet he can't he can't kill her. It's his it's his own it's his own blood, you know. I mean that's a that's a marvelous uh, uh, film uh, predicament to be in, you know. So uh, that, that's that that's what I that's what I I enjoyed about it, and this whole. Um, vampire thing you know this is a whole um and i still have to put my finger on why kids are attracted to this i i i think that maybe it's that you know they want to be young or want to stay young forever oh uh, um, uh, yeah go ahead pj that's I'm part sorry. of it i was just going to say that yeah i think that's part of it yeah. that whole draw it you know can you how can you live forever and um yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, to draw a parallel to another vampire movie, I mean, it's almost the story of the Lost Boys. You know, okay. to be young and live forever. Right, mm-hmm. right. You know, I mean, I definitely yeah. think that's an, inter- that's an interesting take on it. Yeah. yeah, and the human's aging is definitely a part of, of this, mm-hmm. you know, and the relationships between people. Um, so, yeah, that was a real kind way to express that, Joe. Thank you. Uh-huh. And, and, you know, the, the, the vampires, it seems... Uh, with, with with these movies and with PJs and, and Steve's, they're becoming much more human, you know, mm-hmm. much much more uh, y- human emotions, you know. Uh, that right. I, I like. I mean, I like that. Right now, yeah. now for you, Bill. I mean, you know, iconically, Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre Two. You know, you have played one of the pinnacle characters in horror genre history. You know, usually when, when an actor, you know, lands a role like that, they basically have a ticket to work on whatever they want in the genre. What was it that, that really drew you into into the caretakers, and what do you feel like sets it apart from anything else you've worked on? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I love Bill's voice, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, just, I mean, if Which we wanted question? to streamline it down, what I mean, what do you feel like is, what do you feel like this film brings that films in your in your past, you know, have not? Ah, uh, 
Uh, I think this film, uh, which I enjoy, uh, you've heard of the Horns of the Dilemma, you know, this way or that way, which way do I go, and what level of responsibility am I going to play at? And that is, I, I think, uh, a, a film, uh, a, a lens that uh, filters uh, those questions in this movie. What you gonna do when the piano's coming at you? You gotta <laughs> the fallen pianos above coming down, and you gotta do a bunch of stuff in that space around you. Who do you take care of first? You got dependents, and then you got strangers. Where you where you gonna go? What you gonna do? I felt that kind of pressure and you know, and uh, importance of you know responsibility. Or on responsibility. I, I like that a lot in this movie. And it's a real different character for you from what you played in um, Lucid, also. So, uh, oh, yeah. I thought it was, yeah, it was pretty ironic. <laughs> <laughs> the cast so choices. I think, I think that was a little no, bit me, of a draw. I, I, I'm writing now, a, Stephen, a piano Go analogy ahead. down, and I'm going to use that forever now. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Steve and PJ, let me ask you, you know, what do you think it brought to your project to bring on Joe and Bill, you know, the experiences that they've had from, from the films that they've worked on and the types of films? You know, how do you feel like it, it helped with the cast and the production as a whole? Oh, it was great. I mean, they were they're really both perfect for the for the roles that they played. I mean, they 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 pretty much nailed what I was going for when I wrote those characters. And uh I mean, so that's first and foremost. I mean, they they are these characters. They brought to life these characters that I created and and it's exactly what I was going for. And I got to say they were both just a, a pleasure to direct. You just tell them what to do and they do it. They were. They were. We had a lot well, to cover in, in in a short amount of time, and they they were just great. I mean, it, that day ran so smoothly. It was, you know, it was wonderful. I got to. I had the pleasure of driving them mostly, and <laughs> listening to them talk, and it was really, really fun. <laughs> they have a lot of. Um, they had a lot of interesting conversations and a lot of very philosophical things to say. So, I, I got that benefit <laughs> on top of everything else. And, and you know it was uh, it, it was terrific because I mean you know Bill has been in the business for years and, and I've been around a little bit and that we've never worked together you know and and that we we got the opportunity I think is uh, is terrific you know and be able to to to, to see what uh, you know to get a chance to talk to Bill you know so PJ thank yeah. you for that ride to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> and I- yeah. I think that, you know, the two of them together in a scene just really, um, you know, just raises the the excitement about, about the movie, I think, for all of our fans. Um, you know, to have it raises the the, the level of, of our of our filmmaking. I mean, I think we all, you know, tried a little harder, try, uh, worked a little more to to get everything to a little bit higher level having them involved. Don't you think, Steve? Wow. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. What impact do you feel like they had on the rest of the crew? Because, um, you know, like um, I worked on a film where, I, you know, I got to meet Sonny Landham for a cup of coffee, but it was like being on – him being on set, it was just – it was almost like an awe factor with, with the production crew. How did your other actors and, and crew feel about having them on set? Well, actually, I mean, the – the guys are so laid back. It was just real comfortable for everybody. I think everybody just kind of settled in, and it was just uh, it was just kind of like a a little family get together kind of. I mean, it was it was just a very relaxed, comfortable. Nobody was nobody was nervous or anything. That I mean, any any nerves or anything went away pretty quick. Everybody was just. Uh, I mean, it was just a very comfortable setting. Well, yeah. you hear you about, know you know. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry, PJ. Oh no! I was just going to say, you hear about people being difficult on set, but these guys put everybody at ease so quickly, you know. So uh, everybody was very excited about working with them, definitely. Um, but yeah, it, it was a great experience. And and, and you know, I, I I don't know about Bill, but most of the actors I, I work with, uh, you know, rookies and, and established stars, they're all pretty generally pretty nice people, 
you know, yeah. and, and they just, you know, they, they show up for work and very professional and do the absolute best they can. And, you know, just, just human beings in, in this um, aura that is that that is put around them from the outside, I, I think a, a lot of them are really unaware of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it it is a rarity these days. I mean, you can say what you want. I've worked with, you know, new actors. I've worked with actors that you know have been in the industry for over twenty years, and it's it's almost a, a rarity these days to you know to hear a nice story like that. You know, someone like Joe, someone oh. like Bill, being on oh, set wow. and being you know oh. being so gracious. You usually don't hear things yeah. like that. So I mean, it's very oh, nice to hear. Anything. <laughs> oh, oh wow! Well, I guess I've been working with the right people then, because uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, that's case, well, I mean, you know, know it's yeah. you know, and then, you know, I'm not going to call on any names. I mean, I'm not trying to do that. But, Come on, I mean, well, give us a couple. Come on. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's, that's career suicide, and we all know that. But I mean, it's you know, it's. It's it's nice to hear that you know actors could come up on set you know and and you know say hi Joe or hi Bill and you know not be afraid of getting growled at or being kicked off set. I mean yeah. I've been on sets where I've seen it happen, so it's nice to yeah. hear that the set very you know had that family feel to it and that everyone yeah. got along. Yeah, what? you know the one the one thing that, that uh, kills me is uh, is um, method actors, but outside of that, you know. Uh, you know, they're going through a door, and the director's got to explain to them six different ways why they're going through that door. You know, <laughs> but but you know, that's just me. You know. No, I mean, I certainly understand that. Yeah. So, I mean, what are, what is you know what is everyone's ultimate hopes for the caretakers? I mean, I know that you're looking to put it out on DVD, but you know, are there hopes of it? You know, getting picked up by you know a large company. I mean, what are, what are you guys looking at? Yeah, that's the hope. Uh, I, we're, I mean, we're already talking to our uh, our uh, digital uh, distributor, and we've already got uh, plans in the motion for it uh, in that regard. So uh, we've got we've got high hopes for it. Uh, we'll we'll see what happens, but uh, yeah, we're we're excited about it. I, I think this one will. Uh, we're hoping it'll take it to the to the next level. And yeah. you know, every good film's got a chance. I mean, if the right person. Uh, sees it, you know, that's in the right position, you know, it, it, it can find itself in the theaters, you know. So, uh, I mean, that's always that's always uh, a, a chance with uh, any good movie. Yeah, theater with an R-E rather than the E-R. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, we've only got a few more minutes left, so... Uh, there are a few questions, there, or there's a question each for Joe and Bill I have to ask, or the fan base will kill me. Bill, you first. You you played Leatherface. You know, you stepped into that role. All yeah. of these years later, are you still surprised by how much fan reaction the character gets? And if the opportunity were to ever come up again, would you reprise the role? Yep. Yeah. I sure <laughs> would. <laughs> it's a yeah, yeah. And I'm surprised. I am. Um, am I still surprised? Uh, presupposes that I was surprised to begin with, which I really wasn't. I was kind of expecting it since the pop. You know, there were 13 years of, you know, build up before I got into that franchise. Unquote. I am gladdened that it still is. Popular, uh, yeah, that's more. Uh, I may be surprised by it but too. If, uh, I know fans; there are new fans keep coming along every generation, mm-hmm. and it's nice. Like, uh, like I thought that film was Leatherface was different than the other Leatherfaces. Right, I was going against the family. He was going, he was going for the heart and. And not for, I mean, <laughs> the right. heart rather than the actual beating heart. And uh, and like uh, PJ and uh, uh, Steve's films, I'm thinking of that Simon and Garfunkel song about uh, using, you know, speaking uh, of words that matter, you know, uh, of things that matter and words that must be said. And they don't usually get on the big screen. And I'm glad that this avenue is provided 
so we can get back to, you know, theater started out as a religious thing. Didn't Entertainment didn't show up until a lot later. And uh, I like the, the kind of religious, I feel a kind of a, a religious, old-timey religious feeling making movies with uh, big biting pigs. Oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, Joe, I, I got to ask you this. Now, the movie, a lot of times when, when I brought your name up about being on the show to people I knew, the title, the movie that everyone brought up was The Catcher. But the movie oh I want to ask you oh. about, the movie I want to ask you about, because I have a copy on VHS, but it does not work anymore. What can hmm. you tell me about 1996's Werewolf and your role as Joel in the movie? Well, you know, uh, there uh, you just mentioned uh, two of the uh, uh, movies that I absolutely hate, and the, uh, <laughs> oh, God. Uh, uh, the the catcher was horrid. You know, I, I I tell you something. I usually, I mean, I not usually, I try to do the best that I possibly can with every movie that I do. Uh, the catcher, I just missed the mark. I just, I, I, I saw about ten, uh, five, ten minutes, and I said, "Oh my God, I hated myself." So that, that, that's, the, that's the catcher. Uh, werewolf. Uh, thank goodness I was, I was in there for only a little bit of time. You know, I got, I got killed off pretty early, so it was relatively painless. I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed of my uh, uh, performance, but uh, you know. A lot of things, I don't know about Bill, but a lot of things, not that, you know, but a lot of things uh, we do as actors, you know, we do to to, 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 to pay the bills. I mean, I, I love being in front of the camera, but some scripts I enjoy uh, uh, a lot more than uh, others. I think that um, that Werewolf did so well because it was a DVD at the time. And it had um, oh, what's that? Uh, what's it called on the cover where you turn it one way and it turns into the werewolf? Got that hologram on it. The ho- hologram, hologram. Yeah. yeah. And I think that made that picture sell so well uh, <laughs> because I, I've never seen another one like that when you know uh, on the shelves. But you know, I, I thought you were going to ask me about Soul Taker, and, and uh, so that's a first. The, the, thank you for those two. And, I, I like to be surprising in my interviews. You know, I don't, you, I don't always like very, to go for very the obvious surprising. One. <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know, on yeah. a personal note, just for that, they may not have been your favorite movies, but I still enjoyed your, you know, your roles in them. So I mean, it. God bless you. Well, thank you, know, you for that. Thank you. Not a problem. Yeah. Well, okay. we have a well, few minutes left, so before we go. If you guys have any projects that you want to mention that you're coming up in, please feel free to do so. Um, what do you got there, Bill? I got the Monster Mania coming up in March. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Well, well. I, 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 is it coming out in March, or you're shooting it in March, Bill? It's a uh, Monster Mania convention is in uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Oh, okay. I, yeah. In the first or second uh, week of March and uh, it, Monster Mania really is giant it probably rivals uh, the big show up further north there um, that uh, has been on f- forever and uh, hmm. I'm, uh, yeah I'm having a, a, a brain decision right now uh, you're not talking about I, the, the Fangoria Hall of Fame weekends are you? Oh no no it's 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 the multimedia show. Uh, oh oh okay. Comic Con. Yeah, okay, um, no, no. Oh. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, what are you going to be doing up there? Bill. What are you going to be doing up there? <laughs> right, way to go, Bill. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joe, do you have? Are you going to be doing like an yeah. autograph meet and greet? Or are you doing a film panel? What are you doing up there for it? Days uh, meeting the fans, saying howdy, signing. You know, uh, memorabilia and doing Q and A's. You know, that sort of thing. The usual. It's really nice. Mm. It's still excellent, though. Come on, I'm curious. Yeah, uh, I, you know, I I wrote uh, two um, pieces called one's called Pizza Man, the other's called Hobos, and uh, you know, we finally got uh, money uh, to make them, and they're they're they're, they're the, you know the two 
stories I'm going to put together and make make one movie. But uh, it's just two actors in in the, in in both stories, and uh, Ed Asner and I are, are playing uh, both the characters. And so I, I'm really we we start shooting on February 15th, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. This is the first uh, thing that that I've written that I was able to sell the script and and uh, producer. Uh, uh, an investor actually put up some money to to make it, so I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled. I'm just, very uh, good, very good. Yeah, that sounds yeah, nice. Like, well, that's good. Yeah, life is, life is good. Yeah. PJ and, and Steve, then I, what about you? Oh, go ahead, Joe. I'm sorry. No, and then I and I'm always sitting and waiting by the phone for for PJ to call me for her next movie. <laughs> <laughs> I should also well, mention and that. Steve, go ahead. I was gonna, I was going to mention uh, that. Uh, Bill Bill Johnson and Joe Estevez both have um, Facebook pages as well. If you want to, uh, that's going to like them uh, and follow yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. So they're, if you if you wanted to follow up uh, more on what they're doing, you can uh, like those pages. And you can find us on Facebook, Big Biting Pig Productions, wow. and our website. Yeah. If you if you if you wanted to see any of the movies that we've been talking about in the past hour or any of our movies. It's pretty easy. You just have to go to our website, which is www.bigbitingpigproductions.com, and we have uh, it's a it's a pretty easy uh, site to navigate. And and uh, any movies that you want to see, we have it all listed on on how to do it there. So uh, hope some folks will uh, swing by and oh. check out some of our stuff. Yep. And do you guys have anything on tap, uh, past caretakers? Well, I'm already writing the next script. <laughs> which we'll be filming we'll be filming um in the f- probably late summer and fall mm-hmm. so that's it's, what, it's, you know. it's, it's like an obsession isn't it uh, Steve PJ I mean you, <laughs> you guys start this it's like it's like having children you can't you know you just can't you know you you you, nope. you, you go ahead we're crazy we're crazy, we're we're crazy. Yeah. We are. Yeah. yeah yeah we're that's we're why we, that's why down. we love you though yeah <laughs> Well, guys, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart and Horse Society, Joe, Bill, thank you for you know so much for coming on. You get, you've given me years of entertainment, and I look forward to many more years. PJ and Steve, I'm looking forward to seeing the Caretakers. I would love to do a review of it once it's up and get it up on Horse Society. Anytime you guys have any horror news or you want to come on the podcast to talk about any of your work, you are always more than welcome to do so. So thank you very much for everything, and thank you for being on. Thank oh, you. Well, thank, thank you, you. Thank so much. for having us. Uh, no problem, blast. guys. And I will make sure you guys get the uh, – no problem. I'll make sure you guys get the edit archive of this this week. Wonderful. Excellent. All right, thank guys, thank you, you so guys. much for being on. All right, thank you. Okay, bye, guys. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, a phenomenal, phenomenal interview. We just got done interviewing PJ Woodside and Steve Hudgens of Big Biting Pig Productions, and we had two of their co stars on with us, both genre legends, Joe Estevez and Bill Johnson, to talk about their upcoming film, The Caretakers. As soon as we have more information about The Caretakers and where you can purchase and or download it, We will certainly have something up at HorseSociety.com, and we will certainly bring it up here on the Calling Hours Horror Podcast. So we have interviewed our friends at the Texas Terror Entertainment in our Indie Spotlight this evening, and of course we just finished our interview with our friends at Big Biting Pig Productions We've also heard our first song in our Metal Blade Spotlight from the Spotlight band, Sister. We are going to go into our second Metal Blade Spotlight song for the evening, also by Sister, off of the album Disguised Vultures. The song is Naked.
and that was Naked from Sister off of their most recent album, Disguised Vulture. Or excuse me, Disguised Vultures. They are in our Metal Blade spotlight for the night. Thank you to my good friend Kelly out at Metal Blade Records for sending that along for us to listen to. To give you a little bit of background on Sister and Disfigured Vultures, Metal Blade's records released it on the 21st of January of this year. The sleaze punk influenced metal outfit known as Sister, who hail from Stockholm, John Comping, Sweden, formed in early 2006, working hard to build up a name as a strong act both live and in the studio. Sister consists of four members who combine the sounds of punk, glam, rock, and metal with an end result sounding something like the bastard child of G.G. Allen and Guns N' Roses. During 2006 and 7, Sister played all over Sweden and also traveled abroad often. In 2008, Sister toured across Europe, including gigs in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Holland, Denmark, and Norway. In 2009, Sister released the EP Dead Boy Making Noise and a video for the track Too Bad For You, which garnered great reviews from critics and fans alike, while also catching the attention of Primordial's Alan Averill. Alan, having recently signed on to assist with the A&R at Metal Blade Records, brought Sister to the label's attention in 2010, helping to secure the band a worldwide record deal. Sister's first full-length album, Hated, was released in June 2011. The album was recorded by Martin Sweet and mixed by Tobias Lindell, hardcore superstar, Crash Diet in Europe, and got critical acclaim all over the world. Since then, the band has toured with UDO, hardcore superstar, Wednesday 13 from the Murder Dolls, Crash Diet, and Fozzy. They have played at festivals like Sonosphere Spain in 2012, where they opened the big stage, and Bang Your Head Festival in 2012 in Germany. So, in autumn of 2013, Sister recorded the follow-up album, The Hatred, together with Martin Sweet and Linus uh, Nibrant. The single, Sick, has been released on a limited edition color vinyl in October, and together with a video shortly before their second tour with Wednesday 13 in Europe. Uh, The new album, Disfigured Vultures, really shows what the band is about with their heavy, raw sound and attitude. It was released on January 24th via Metal Blade in the United States. Um, so, you know, usually not the you, not the usual metal you hear from me. I'm usually more of the death metal, black metal kind of kind of guy. Um, but you know, there was something about their sound that you know, kind of appeal to me. I, I, I don't know. I am a Guns N' Roses fan. Some G.G. Allen does a, does appeal to me. Um, but, you know, again, it, it may not be the first choice that goes into my CD player, but it is definitely melodic enough to warrant worth listening to again. I, I plan on listening to it again myself to catch a little bit more of the nuances in the CD. But, you know, if you like that, that power kind of thrash sound, this is definitely an album that you need to pick up. So, you know, go out and check this out. You can get it from MetalBlade.com. You can also download it from iTunes. Um, Look for the full CD review coming up on Horror Society here in the next couple of days. Now we are going to discuss our Blu-ray DVD review for the week. And once again, it comes to us from Shout Factory. And I'm dipping into a movie that I can honestly tell you that I've never seen before. That movie is Saturn 3. And just to give you the background on Saturn 3, Adam, played by Kirk Douglas, and Alex, by Farrah Fawcett, are two scientists stationed deep beneath the barren surface of Saturn's third mood, Titan. They live together in idyllic isolation from a space, in a space-age Eden, seeking new forms of food for an exhausted planet Earth. Their perfect world is interrupted when Benson, played by Harvey Keitel, arrives as Saturn goes into eclipse and cuts off communications with the rest of the solar system. Aided by his helper robot Hector, James reduces life to one singular purpose, survival. The robot becomes violently unmanageable. For Adam and Alex, their only hope is to flee, but the homicidal robot stands in their way. 
Produced and directed by legendary filmmaker Stanley Donnan, singing in the rain, charade, and seven bridges for seven brothers, Saturn Three is a pulse-pounding study in sci-fi suspense. And again, you know, I'll be the first one to admit I had never seen this film, so I can't compare it to previous versions. What I can tell you is it does look amazing, once again, just like any other Screen Factory release does. Um, it does have a new high-definition transfer. Uh, there is commentary by Greg Moss uh, from the Saturn 3 fan site and film critic David Bradley. There's interviews with Academy Award-winning special effects artist Colin Chavers and actor Roy uh, Dotrice. There are delete, there's a deleted scene. There's also an additional scene from the ne- uh, additional scenes from the network television version of the film, the theatrical trailer, the TV spots, and the still gallery. You know, and, and the one that I found to be the most interesting was the interview with the special effects artist uh, Colin Chilvers. Um, really found him, you know, a lot of the the talk about the practical effects and everything like that. So, I, you know, and and you know how they did the robot, the explosion, and everything like that. Um, you know, just really fascinating. Um, and again, you know, they talked about you know the practical effects and the building of the robot suit and. You know, how they had someone walking in the suit and, you know, like, uh, you know, props for the hands and close-up scenes, anything like that. Um, you know, again, it, you know, it's a beautiful transfer. Definitely one of the nicest, uh, one of, uh, you know, in my opinion, one of the nicer ones that Scream Shout Factory has done. Um, you know, you don't notice any grain. Um, I love the choice in actors in the film. I, uh, I really felt that, uh, you know, seeing Harvey Keitel that young and in, in the role of such an an evil character, you know, it it, it, it was kind of funny to see it. Um, but again, uh, you know, and it's not his voice in the film, which which is interesting. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, you know, and then you had, you know, Farrah Fawcett, I mean... What can what can you say bad about Farrah Fawcett? I mean, amazing in the role, you know, young, beautiful. Um, you know, you felt for her character and and what was going on. So, you know, that was great. And Kirk Douglas, Kirk Douglas was an amazing shape for this film. You know, and and in the interviews on the behind the scenes, you know, that's mentioned about what great shape he was in. You know, and. And he, you know, he and, and Farrah Fawcett really didn't look that mismatched. So when you see them on the screen, it's not, you know, like the the eighty year old man with the, with the twenty year old girl. So, you know, I, I really felt like you know, you know, a fun film, more definitely more in the sci fi vein. Um, you almost get the the impression of uh, a slasher film once once the robot loses its mind and, and starts going after everything. You know, it's uh, interest. Uh, the movie kind of raises interesting aspects. If you could connect the human brain to a robot, you know, control and things like that, learning ability, things along those lines. But you know, definitely more of a sci- of, of a sci-fi. It has its fair share of of blood. Uh, guy gets sucked through a vacuum lock and the body explodes. You know, kind of chunky stuff floating around. So. That's always fun to watch, you know, those of us that have, have the gore hound in us. Um, I really think that the robot looked good, you know, considering the time and, and things like that. So, you know, the robot was very believable in that sense. You know, the spaceship effects, you know, while at times you could sit there and look at some of the effects and go, oh, it's hokey, it's outdated. Well, you know, you got to remember it's an older film, but it still holds up well over time. I think the acting was, was phenomenal. Um, you know, like I said, Kirk Douglas. When, when's the last time you're going to say you saw Kirk Douglas and Har- Harvey Keitel and Farrah Fawcett in the same movie? I mean, that's you know, nowadays you try to put that film together. What that you know, we can't anymore. But you know, if you tried to put that film together today, it would be damn near impossible, I think. But it's a nice glimpse into past stars of the screen and you know, a current star of the screen in Harvey Keitel. So, I mean, my recommendation would be is, is to certainly go out and get it. Like I said, if you're a sci-fi fan, it certainly fits. It has its horrific elements. Um, some of the sound effects, actually, it's kind of funny. Um, uh, one of the robots they have in the um, in the movie, when it makes movements, it sounds like the doors that open and close from aliens. 
So I, I found that to be a fun little a fun little facet if you're looking for interesting little things to look for in the film. So definitely head on over to Shout and Scream Factory. Um, pick it up. You can get, if they're still available, they should have some of the 18 by 24 posters with it. If not, um, should have got one sooner. But it's 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 definitely worth picking up, um, so make sure and do that. I'm kind of hoping I'll have a surprise caller to help promote next week's show. So let us see. Well, just to set up the show, for next week's show, we are going to be having Rebecca Herzberg on from Women in Horror Monthly. And she, and in fact, it looks like here she is now. This, hello. Hello, is this Rebecca? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Rebecca, it's the Dead Man from Horror Society. How are you this evening? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I just wanted to bring you on so that we can, um, I'm really excited for next week's show. And I wanted to see, I didn't want to spoil anything to the crowd, but... So people know what's going on, kind of, you know, I'm going to have you on as my guest next week, and we're going to talk about your work and, and your blog and the things that you've done with the horror genre. We're going to talk about Women in Horror Monthly. Um, first of all, why don't you tell everyone about Women in Horror Monthly and what you do with them? Well, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm not part of the board, and I think people get that confused. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I am one of there's, and I'm not just the only ambassador. There's several of us that are ambassadors for Women in Horror Month. Uh, a lot of us just basically we throw a lot of charity events mm-hmm. and just uh, promote women in horror. Like uh, for me, uh, everyone in my community knows me as someone that uh, throws a lot of these charity events because. My mother and my grandmother were a big part of the uh, Women's Association of Beaumont. And my grandmother especially was always, you know, just throwing these charity events or even just, you know, any little donations that she could. And it stuck with me. And uh, every year, all year long, I donate to the women shelter, women and children's shelters, uh, just food, clothing, whatever I can, and I try to rally up as many people as I can, but I've never actually locally thrown a charity event that ties in with Women in Horror Month. And I was involved with Women in Horror Month last year, and I've known Hannah for years, so I thought, well, why not, you know, try to make this bigger and, you know, show some films by some amazing women. Like, uh, we we are going to show American Mary, which I actually do genuinely like. I know there's a lot of drama behind that, but uh, I know nobody. Like I don't know, people are weird, but like, and I have said several times that I didn't. I didn't even like Dead Hooker in a Trunk, and I'm probably not gonna like their uh, See No Evil too. I think mm-hmm. because I didn't like I didn't like the first one. You know, respectfully, it doesn't mean that I don't like the Soskas. I adore them, and we get along great. You know, I love talking to them. And uh, But I genuinely like American Mary. I really enjoyed that film, and so that's why I'm showing it, not because I'm trying to kiss her ass or anything like that. Right. But uh, that, and we have another local girl here who uh, has a film that she made. She actually... I also direct the horror portion of a film festival here that ran through February last year, which was during Women in Horror Month, and her film won first place. And she has another film this year, and she'll be showing the trailer for her film at our charity event. And so that's what I have to do with Women in Horror Month anyway. Well, very nice. Well, like I said, we're going to have you on next week as as the hour-long guest. Like I said, we're going to talk about your podcast. We'll talk about the film festival. We'll talk about all of that. But, you, mm-hmm. you know, you mentioned the Soska sister, sisters, and they're going to be calling in during the show as well. Um, mm-hmm. Do you have any other Do you have any other guests that you know are going to be joining us, or is it just going to be yes. an element uh, of surprise? It, some of it's going to be a bit of a surprise. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not going to say all. I, you can definitely count Heidi who's, you know, on the board, Hannah, who is the creator of Women in Hormones. 
and uh, a fellow writer, BJ, I can never pronounce her name, and I feel so horrible. I hope she's not listening to that. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, BJ, I love you. I can never pronounce her last name. Uh, but, yeah, there are some other girls that are expected to call in, but they had busy schedules, and so I will not know until either maybe the day before ahead of time, you know, and so maybe there might be some surprise callers. Very nice. Well, Rebecca, I just wanted to have you on. I know you're excited about next week. I'm excited about next week. I know the Soskas are because they posted on their Facebook page. So Mm -hmm. tell everyone where they can go online before the show so that they can check out Women in Horror Month, um, any websites, anything like that you want to share for right now. Uh, Well, we actually, uh, Hannah just relaunched the Women in Horror Month website. So if you go to womeninhorrormonth.com, it may pull up, but it's still under construction as well. It's it's not quite February yet, so keep checking back. And, uh, you know, we post all the announcements there on Facebook. All you got to do is search for Women in Horror Recognition Month on Facebook, and you'll see that, and you'll see all the, even, like, the blood drives, like, the Soskas every year do their blood drive, and um, it's been going on for years. It's a lot of charity events that are fun. It's not just, it's, it's another one of the things I love about it. It's not just to talk about females that we love in the horror industry, but it's also about helping and giving to others that are in need, so... Well, excellent. Well, all next week, keep in mind, we can talk about the charity and all of that as much as you want. Thank you for coming on the Hype It tonight, and I'm looking forward to having you next week. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Anytime, Rebecca. And once again, that was next week's guest, Rebecca Herzberg, with the Women in Horror Monthly. She will be joined by the Soska Twins, Heidi Martinuzzi, and a few other people that uh, may surprise us. Well, before we sign off for the week, uh, once again, I want to say thank you to our friends at Scream Factory for sending us the Blu-ray copy of Saturn 3 to pick up. Make sure to go to ScreamFactory.com to pick up a copy of the film. Uh, I also want to say thank you to my friends that came on this evening. I had Steve Hudgens and PJ Woodside of Big Biting Pig Productions on. They brought on their co-stars, Joe Estevez and Bill Johnson, co-stars of The Caretakers. Thank you so much for coming on. We also, in our indie spotlight, had our friends from Texas Terror Entertainment on Necrostein. Thank you for coming on. And as we close the show like we always do, this is the last bit of our Metal Blade Spotlight. Coming out just in time for The Dead Man's Birthday, which is Saturday, this CD will be hitting the shelves February 4th, and the world better tremble, because here is Behemoth's new CD, off of The Satanist, the title track, The Satanist, and until next week, rest in peace.